Uh, hello, everyone who joined us already. Uh, we will start in a minute's time. Okay, I uh, think we are ready to start. Um, hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to Iraq Britain Business Council's Women's Group video discussion. Uh, my name is Agnia Bramoskaite. I am Events Coordinator, Senior Administrator at IBBC. Uh, and I am also a co-founder of IBBC's Women's Group. Uh, today's webinar is all about women in business. We will talk about the current challenges in the working environment, especially paying attention to COVID-19 crisis and how it changed our lives overall. We will also share insights about the future perspectives and opportunities for women in business world. Today, we have an excellent speakers who will introduce themselves shortly. Also, uh, at the end, we will have a brief Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please use raise your hand icon at the bottom of your screens and your mic will be activated. So without further ado, I would like to introduce today's chair, Ms. Samar Tamer, Tamer Al-Mafraji, who is the Managing Director at AMS Iraq. Please, Samar. Thank you very much, Agni. Hi, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Uh, I, would well, uh, I would welcome the IBBC members and friends, and I hope you, your family, your beloved one, uh, all safe and well in this pandemic. Uh, we are delighted today to have you join us in this webinar on the economic impact and challenges that come with COVID-19. Uh, today, we have assembled an excellent panel of experts from different sectors who will have be talking about their own challenges, about their own stories and ideas for an additional action that certainly will be needed in the future. And to help you understand further the implication of COVID-19 and more importantly, position your business to be resilient in the future by listening to the thinking and insight from our speakers. I am joined today by uh, Caroline Meggar. She is the Managing Director of Think Bank. She lived and worked in Iraq since 2016. Uh, Caroline, Caroline, she is going to highlight her stories uh, since her work in Iraq. And she is going to tackle the uh, uh, statistics that she made about, you know, the. Uh, you know, think bank uh, strategy in Iraq. We have Fatin Risa Sarraf. She is one of the uh, best Iraqi architecture. She's the founder and managing director of Final Fix Interiors. Uh, Fatin, she's originally from Basra and she finished her uh, studies in the architecture in Baghdad. Uh, she lives in uh, many different countries and she designed her roadmap to the business. Uh, she is going to talk as well about her stories in the business and the challenges that she is facing according to the uh, economic crash. We have Samar Rassam, she's the director of Summer Industrial Projects. She's originally from Iraq as well and she finished her engineering study uh, in Baghdad. And then she moved to uh, London and worked for Bechtel and Amic Oil and Gas. Uh, Samar is going to, to tackle uh, the corpse and pros of uh, COVID 19 and the impact uh, of its uh, business. We have Paulina uh, Argodin, she is a senior analyst at G4S. 
Paulina, she's going to uh, talk about the uh, impact of uh, coronavirus on the uh, security sector, especially in Iraq. Last but not least, myself. Uh, I think I am known for many IBBC members. Uh, and as you read in my bio, uh, my name is Samar Mafraji. I'm the managing director of AMS Iraq. I have born in Baghdad and I have uh, finished my studies in the English literature in Mustan Siliya University. I have graduated in 1998 and after my graduation, I have left uh, Iraq uh, to uh, Dubai. Uh, in Dubai, actually, uh, I uh, consider uh, the city, uh, it was, you know, the, the base for myself to design my future map and to expand in the work and in the education. Uh, actually, in uh, Dubai, I have joined the uh, American University and I have studied uh, political science. Then I studied in Oxford University the uh, leadership skills. Then I have uh, finished my uh, master education in the UK in the whole business school and I have studied the economic and uh, the uh, business management. Uh, 2008, I decided to uh, put myself in, in the business uh, environment. Uh, I have joined Dubai government. I was working in the marketing uh, uh, studies and in the marketing research for Dubai government. I have worked for two years with Dubai government, then uh, 2010 up to this minute, um, a director, the development director of uh, AMS group. AMS Group is an uh, English company specialized in uh, access and uh, scaffolding uh, solution. We have many different offices around the world, our headquarters in the UK, and we have many operation offices uh, in the MENA region. Dubai is the core of our, our business. Uh, so since 2010 up to up to this minute, um, you know, the director of the group. In 2014, I have put a plan for myself to set my work in, in, in Iraq. So we have decided to uh, make a, a local body, an Iraqi body for AMS group in Iraq. Uh, we uh, established AMS Iraq uh, that concern about the training, the HSE training, uh, that uh, uh, target the Iraqi uh, content. Uh, being work with a scaffolding company is considered as uh, the main challenge that I face in my life. Uh, because it's very far from my feminine nature, is very far from my uh, studies and qualifications because uh, scaffolding and uh, construction is uh, mainly male domain. And especially myself, I was born to an Arab family and sharing the cultural heritage values affecting how women are regarded. While my family motivating me to learn and gain knowledge, they, like some other families, viewed female education as a tool for women to win some simple job and conduct non tough tasks. But I always believe in myself uh, and in women outstanding and creative role. And I believe that any attempt to understand and study social changes is achievable only when women are given their rights as they make up more than half of the society. So I decided to join the construction field and I have joined the work and I have achieved many awards, uh, many uh, tangible successful achievements with the cooperation of my colleague and with the leading of the management of AMS. 
uh, and uh, I'm actually going forward to do something in, in, in Iraq. So Iraq, to be honest, is my target place to expand because uh, the Iraqi people, they actually have a shortage and they lack the HSE uh, education. And I am strongly believer that the local content of Iraq is the essential potential that Iraq has. It's the treasure of Iraq. We have to work to, towards improving the, our local content in order to appraise their life, in order to improve their uh, uh, life standards. And I believe uh, that we can make a tangible differences in the local lives by training the local people to have worldwide qualifications and access to international best practices. That's why we have established our training center in Basra, in the location of Burgessia, and we merged this center with the UK safety institutions in order to provide uh, the local laborers in Iraq, especially the workers who are work in uh, the oil and gas sector with high certificates uh, that match the English standard and the uh, modern standards of the world. So for sure, my business recently been affected negatively uh, because of you know, the uh, negative uh, impact of uh, virus on all business sectors. So in Iraq, and as per the UNESCO uh, statics, the closure of Iraqi edu educational institutions all over Iraq uh, in order to contain the uh, coronavirus epidemic has affected 95% of the students and trainees. National, we see that national exams uh, have been canceled school and universities are closed and learning has moved from classroom to homes. Parents are now, uh, you know, tasked with homeschooling, aiding by digital, digital technology to provide education. And in Iraq, actually, we struggle a lot with this solution due to the lack of uh, good internet. The internet is not uh, reached to the remote areas the high price of uh, the internet, which is, you know, maybe is not affordable with some uh, families that based on the day work uh, wages. And uh, this challenges, it put us in, uh, in a way that we have to think in order to provide uh, a right solution that could help the, uh, situation and the learning situation in Iraq, the educational situation in, in Iraq. And at the same time, we have another challenges that we have to maintain the education and the training enthusiasm in the uh, work sector and for the, you know, for our uh, students and pupils. The challenge today is to reduce the negative impact of the pandemic on learning whenever possible, and to use the experience to improve learning at faster pace. So uh, as a training uh, groups, as a training uh, uh, providers, we need to avoid the negative impact of the crisis. And we have to be careful about deepening the gaps in society. Everyone know that COVID-19 is a human uh, tragedy. And what we should focus on in this conversation and for our esteemed uh, speakers, it's important to know that this disease is contagious economically as it is medically. The negative impact of this virus is being felt by all business sector around the world. So our experience from the past shocks, uh, including the global financial crisis in 2008, has taught us a lot, and uh, especially in, in the MENA region. And it's taught us that we have to keep our companies solvent, 
is the key to saving jobs and limiting the economy, uh, the economic damage. Uh, and, you know, I believe that speed is of the essence. But in Iraq, the scenario is different. And I think the speakers that are listening to me right now and who uh, observed my previous speech and all my conferences that I have been in, you know, I always, you know, talk openly, you know, and I'm, I'm not, you know, giving uh, rosy images about uh, Iraq because we have to be uh, open, we have to be clear in order to tackle our main issues and in order to provide the right and the wise solution to overcome these issues. Iraq, unfortunately, is in a fragile situation. It faces a difficult physical crunch arising from the col collapse in international oil prices that reached to 20 few, uh, a few months ago. Uh, and this crisis is coupled with political and social turmoil. So the situation in Iraq is worse than any uh, part of the world. It's, I believe that you know, many, many countries are struggling. But in Iraq, you know, uh, the, uh, actually the rapid spread of COVID-19 and the, uh, the country healthcare system has limited capacity and limited fiscal budgets to contain and manage. So the crisis in Iraq is big and the crisis was unexpected uh, and that's make it more difficult to mitigate. But the, the key right now is to act swiftly to implement our response. We don't like and we don't want actually to repeat the scene of last October when we uh, see a hundred of thousands of young Iraqis going to the streets in mass protest to stand against corruption, uh, poor services and high unemployment. Uh, these uh, young people uh, that lead you know, the big demonstration exposed the fragility of the Iraqi socio-economic system. And it refers that many things going wrong. Unfortunately, since 2003, the structure that had been put to Iraq was sectarian st structure and people have had enough of dysfunctional government. So summer in Iraq is known to everybody, especially for the people who are in Iraq right now, is hot. And when I say hot, I mean it's 50 degrees and, up, and upper sometimes in the shade, and no electricity, no services, and the state of country in a bad state. And we see there are billions of dollars going down the drains and um, people in the government reaching, reaching themselves. That's why we need a clean management to clean up the systems. But despite, I don't want actually to talk further about you know, uh, uh, the uh, government strategies and all stuff, but I'll, I'll try to uh, brief you all about the Iraqi scenario that how we see it right now. Despite of what I have mentioned earlier, uh, and despite all the negative uh, scenes that we have seen in Iraq right now, uh, at the same uh, talking and on the other side, we see a light at the end of the tunnel. Iraq political scene uh, going to be changed positively in short time. But whatever its shape and color, the government that take power will have to address serious economic challenges in one of uh, in one uh, or another. Uh, these challenges are related to oil. So Iraq, we, uh, we aim and we are looking forward to bring it back to the uh, Arab uh, countries bunch. And the Arab countries is going to help Iraq soon. And we are going to observe a big development uh, leading by the uh, Arab countries, especially the GCC countries, that will uh, develop the 
energy sectors, the telecommunications sectors, and the security sectors in Iraq uh, in order to uh, return Iraq to uh, be embarrassed by the Arab region and to make the uh, stability and improve the situation of Iraq that will give in reward a stability to the Arab region in uh, general. So this is the point that I would like to highlight in my you know, 15 minutes speech. And I would like uh, now to leave the words for my colleague Caroline to talk about her sectors and about her uh, uh, thinking of how we could uh, deal with the situation right now. So Caroline, this speech for you right now. Thank you. Thank you, Sama. Um, quite a, quite a, someone to follow, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my best. Uh, thank you, Sama. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining the, the webinar, and thank you to IBBC for putting this on. Uh, I've attended a few of these women's groups previously. It's great to see people, and it's great that we can continue to do it uh, digitally uh, while we're all locked down in various points on the planet. Uh, so just to briefly introduce uh, myself, so my name is uh, Caroline McGar. I'm the Managing Director of ThinkBank, uh, a British-Iraqi market research company. Uh, so ThinkBank um, basically designs and conducts customized research uh, in Iraq for uh, a wide range of clients using a wide range of methodologies and we provide advanced analytics and help really local and international clients uh, understand the Iraqi consumer. So we conduct uh, focus groups, questionnaires, and so on, as you'd expect from market research uh, companies. Um, we were founded in uh, 2018. That's myself and my uh, Iraqi national business partner, Rebaz. Uh, and as mentioned, I've been living in Iraq since uh, 2016. So I'm usually resident in Iraq. At the moment, I'm stuck in London. But luckily, uh, the rest of the team is in country and we are continuing the business. Surprisingly, it's gone quite well. Uh, so there's some positives for it. Um, I know the purpose of, of today's uh, webinar is to is discuss the challenges that we face as women uh, working in Iraq or as Iraqi business women. Uh, obviously, I'm British uh, originally, but I do feel part of the community uh, as an observer, at least. Um, I think um, briefly, um, we've had challenges, but we've also had opportunities. So the, the, the key thing I think for us is, is the inability to conduct the face-to-face -face and in-person research in Iraq. Um, in a way, there's been some positives here for us in that we have always tried to encourage our, our clients to consider more the online alternatives. Um, they're widely used outside of Iraq. There's a bit of a reluctance, I think, among some particularly local clients and some international organizations to really embrace uh, the power of online uh, research. But what we've learned from, from the current crisis is that we've been able to provide those alternatives to online focus groups, online surveys, and so on. So I think there's the positive. We've been able to help our clients understand uh, the validity of that as well. Uh, from a... Um, the point of view of what we've been doing that I'm going to share with you today. Um, just before uh, the crisis happened, uh, we actually put into field a survey of the Iraqi consumer 2020. So we have a snapshot of Iraqi attitudes and behaviors pre-COVID, uh, which I'm going to share with you today. Um, and I was going to outline that for you now. Um, I think it touches on some of the things that other members of this panel mentioned last week when we had a pre a webinar discussion. So I'll just share my screen with you now and I'll take you through some of our findings, but let me just ensure we are keeping to time as well. Okay. So, as mentioned, this is our um, Iraq Consumer 2020 survey. I've just pulled out some 
Uh, some findings that are related to women, just so we can look at that. I know there's an interest in, in financial inclusion, access to financial services for business women, and also interest in some digital transformation. This has been covered in our survey. Uh, it's a wide-ranging survey. It was originally um, designed to look at um, the, the, the topics on the left here, so digital behaviours, financial inclusion. We've also looked at online shopping. Uh, travel, food service, FMCG, that's fast moving consumer goods, for those a bit less familiar with, the, uh, with, with that. Um, so just looking at the fieldwork details, so the sample is about just under 2,000 Iraqis, they're internet users because we conducted the survey online. Uh, we've got more men than women because there are far more men online in Iraq than, than females, but we did push up uh, the female element of the sample just by really trying to, to reach those, those women online through different forms of uh, of uh, um, recruitment and so on. Um, it's for 18 to 45 year olds, so that's what we're looking at when we're looking at the figures here. It's important to recall that you will see other figures from Iraq that might be of the whole population, including children, including those who are not online. But we're looking at 18 to 45 year old Iraqi internet users. We focused on the main urban centers in Iraq, so Baghdad, Basra, Nineveh, uh, Najaf, Erbil, and Suleimania. Uh, and for those who are a bit less familiar with Iraq, there might be some uh, joining the webinar. Um, in, the, in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, uh, the language is, is mainly Kurdish, so we do our, our survey in both Arabic and Kurdish. But let's get to uh, what we're interested in, which is some of the, the, the details and the findings. So I think for some of you, you may want to move your um, panel around that shows the speakers just to see the full screens here but thinking about uh, the digital Iraqi um, so for our survey so there's 18 to 45 year olds and focusing on women just under half of women are spending more than five hours online a day so we see there's some opportunity for digital transformation it's slightly lower than the men are spending online a day but you know we have an online active online population uh, in Iraq um, how are Iraqis getting online? So following the discussion we had last week with some of the other panelists, I think this is a really important thing to consider when we're thinking about how we can support women, especially in Iraq with, with online and the challenges they face there. Um, I know other colleagues on the panel will touch on how those challenges are coming about uh, slightly later. But we see that the main way people are accessing online is um, just the main, how they usually access the internet is through public Wi-Fi, followed by landline at home, 3G, MiFi, that's mobile, uh, Wi-Fi uh, devices, and I know that might be Office or some other interpretation of the question. Um, when we look at men and women, there's not a great, great deal of difference between the genders here. But the reason I raise this is I think one aspect to consider overall is we see a huge difference in regional, there's great regional variation of how Iraqis are actually uh, accessing the internet. So while public Wi-Fi is, is, is still dominant in, in south and central Iraq, so that's outside the Kurdistan region, we have just over half accessing the internet, usually by public Wi-Fi. If we look at the Kurdistan region, 59% are accessing via their, their landline at home. And we also have this, this greater use of, of Wi-Fi, mobile Wi-Fi. It's linked to the services available and the quality of internet available and, and for various aspects of approach to the infrastructure. This is for all respondents, it's not just for the female responses, but I think it's something to consider if you're looking at how do we support uh, women, we should take regional differences into account. And as part of the survey, we ask about behaviours and we also ask about attitudes. So a question that I pulled from uh, a UK survey from about 2006, um, which I asked, um, respondents to agree or disagree with various statements. One of those statements was, I'm able to save money by using the internet for certain tasks. I think what's interesting here is, is the number of, of respondents who, who disagree with that statement. Uh, it's 41% for females, but it's, it's um, what's it, 38% overall. I don't think we could imagine that level of disagreement in, in a European country, in, in, in North America, was, you know, there's an issue here with, with how useful the internet is in saving money. And from a business point of view, there's things to consider there. So I think what's lying behind this is some issues that have been raised, the cost of accessing the internet, the, the ease of accessing the internet. In addition, the reason I think we wouldn't, we'd expect to, to feel we could save money by using the internet in the, somewhere like the UK is because of the, 
the way we can use the internet to buy goods, uh, the ease of, of buying online, the, the speed, and often finding uh, a better a better deal perhaps than what we'd find in the traditional uh, bricks and mortar retail and so on. So I think this ties into another aspect of what we covered in, in the survey, which is uh, financial inclusion. So I'll just move on to, to financial inclusion now. And I think that the key take out here, so of those uh, Iraqi Iraqi women, 18 to 45 year old online, um, just 15% have bank accounts. Um, this is, uh, I think, widely known in Iraq. I think the usual figure that's pulled out in most of these uh, online conferences or conferences I've been to is that only 8 million Iraqis out of about 40 million have bank accounts. I suspect there's some double counting in those figures. Um, we tend to find in our surveys about 18% of the online Iraqis say they have bank accounts. So it's slightly lower for women here. There are obvious implications for this. If you have a bank account, it's harder for you to send and receive money. It's certainly harder for you to shop online. There are some alternative services available in Iraq. I know that's very important for those joining the, the discussion today who are interested in digital transformation. We've touched on that as well in our survey. So if we look at the financial service usage, so we asked about various financial services that are available to Iraqis. Um, of all the respondents, so from credit cards down to loan providers or banks outside of Iraq. And we asked here, which of the following have you used in the last month? The key figure here is that the majority say none, uh, and it's far more women uh, than, than than male than men respondents. So 73% of Iraqi women haven't used any of the financial services that we mentioned here in the previous month. Uh, and I think what's interesting here is that includes the, the digital alternatives, uh, which don't appear to be uh, being taken up uh, by Iraqis. It doesn't mean they're not possible, it doesn't mean that we can't find a way to encourage people to take up these services, but currently there's, there's, there's not so much uh, take up or usage, let's say, from this question. Um, just another point on this, you can see the second uh, financial service down is Hawala. I've not included the data here, but we ask about trust in financial institutions in our overall survey, and uh, Hawala is by far the most trusted uh, financial institution. Uh, behind that come, come banks, international, local, and so on. And that's really something that needs to be addressed or understood better. Um, that is covered in our wider uh, Iraq Consumer 2020 um, study, uh, which we'll be sharing more details of over the next few weeks. And then just a final slide that I want to share with you now, I'm just checking on time, uh, is uh, spending priorities. So here we asked uh, respondents if they were given an additional 12 million Iraqi dinar, so about $10,000, what would they spend it on? So some e extra money, not their usual constraints, where, what would they prioritize? They could choose up to three options here. I think what's positive from, certainly from people I know in, in the development sector is that many Iraqis are keen to invest in their own business. Um, it's slightly higher here for, for men than women. 35% of men said they would invest the money in their own business versus 28% of women. That's followed by repaying existing, existing debts. Buying a car is quite a hopeless list here. But I think that's interesting from an Iraqi businesswoman point of view that um, it's still it's among the priorities for women. Uh, it's slightly behind men, so there's clearly some work to do to catch that up. Um, another piece of data that I haven't put on a slide for you here is that that investing in your own business does increase among the younger age groups. So from the 18 to 24 year olds, we have more interested in investing in own businesses. Uh, we see an invert of that for repaying existing debts. So older respondents uh, are more interested to pay their debts than to invest in the business. We'd expect that from life stage as much as anything, but I think it's just, it shows where that, that focus is. So I think that's covered the slides I wanted to share, just some, some key data points that I pulled out of the, the study. We have thousands of data points. We can look by women, women from different regions, different ages. If people are interested, do get in touch. Uh, Anya, is there anything else? Do we have time to share the online shopping data briefly? You said that might be of interest. Yes, please share it. Uh, would be very interesting. Okay, so I'll just quickly go to that slide, uh, which I didn't quite prepare. Um, so I'll give you the overall. Um, I have to do a bit of quick, quick explanation here. So when we talk about online shopping in Iraq, we don't really mean the same thing as we do in most of the countries because of uh, the 
level of unbanked Iraqis. It just makes online shopping a completely different uh, experience. However, Iraqis are buying things online. The figure on the left hand side, 57% shopped online in the last three months. We haven't included everything we've asked about here. We had to ask about very different types of online purchasing uh, behavior. So for example, we did not include um, this figure here. Those who've found a product online, called the retailer and then ordered the product over the telephone. We've excluded that from, from online shopping. Um, many Iraqis would include that as an online purchase. So you have to be very careful what, what you're dealing with when you talk to Iraqis about online. We've excluded that because we think that's just too far outside the norms of online shopping. I think what's interesting is the main, um, uh, let's say, channel for online shopping is to order a product online using messaging. So that's where Iraqis will find a product online, either from a Facebook page or a retailer, or usually through a Facebook page, maybe an Instagram page. We have data on that as well. Um, they then will send a message to that retailer through social media, and that's how they will place their order. There's no click and buy going on here. Well, there's some, but it's, it's very limited. So to order a product or service through an app and pay using in-app payment, 5%. Um, to pay online, use the credit or debit card, 4%. Um, or any other digital payment, 4%. For the most part, it is, it is cash on delivery. That's not, that still happens in, in, in other countries as well, but um, it's how they're clicking, how they're making their orders is different. So there is a willingness to buy online. There's definitely a desire. We have lots of data on the types of products they're buying. I can just show you this by gender breakdown as well for those interested. Um, women are doing far more of this online purchasing through messaging. Uh, men are still keen to, to make telephone calls. Um, here, the kind of products they're buying is, is useful as well. Women are buying um, fashion, uh, shoes, clothes. Uh, men are really into their electrical goods and, and computers. I've got information on that too. I don't think we have time to really share it here, but I just want to give that information. We have information. It's possible to understand what Iraqis are doing. Um, and I think what's gonna be key is um, in September, we will run many questions in this survey again, just to see what that change has been um, following uh, COVID. Um, for more information on that survey, you can contact me, uh, carolinethinkbankirak.com. We'll be sharing some details of this on our website uh, over the coming weeks. We'll be sort of dro dropping out a few different aspects of those areas that we said we'd cover. We're also the official research partner for the Iraq Finance Expo at the end of this month. So we'll be sharing more on digital inclusion, uh, digital transformation, financial inclusion, and e-commerce specifically as well uh, then. But if you'd like to get in touch uh, directly, please do. Uh, as far as the September survey goes, it will again be of 2,000 Iraqis. If there's anyone uh, attending this, members of the IBC Women's Group, or attending this panel who would like to put a question on that survey, get in touch. Uh, we'd be happy to accommodate there well, if we are going to reach 2,000 Iraqis, if it's of interest to you. Um, anything more of a greater priority than um, you know, be in touch sooner. Um, I think that covers it. I'm sorry if I've gone slightly over Anya, but I hope that was useful for everyone. I hope that provides some food for thought for the other panelists as well. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you very much for the interesting panels and the interesting information that you have provided. Very good, excellent job. Thank you so Thank much. You. Now we have to leave the words for uh, Mrs. Fatin. She is going to talk about her story and we keen to listen to Fatin as well as a businesswoman, as a mother of two daughters and how she is managing the life, her, her personal life, her business life with the differences that she uh, unexpected to get nowadays. So the worst for you, uh, Fatin. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Sama. Hi, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you and to share this interesting conversation. Um, thanks for everyone and thanks for, for whom watching us. Um, my name is Fatin. Uh, I'm an architect. I uh, am the managing director and the founder of Final Fix Interiors. Uh, it's an interior design and fit out uh, uh, firm based in Dubai. Um, uh, since 2009. I opened a branch in Erbil in 2012 
and another branch in Sydney, Australia in 2016. Um, I finished my, uh, my uh, architecture study in Baghdad University. I was born in Basra, but I studied, uh, I finished my university in Baghdad because at that time, there wasn't any architectural uh, department in the College of Engineering in Basra University. So I had to, to go to Baghdad and that was my first challenge uh, to study uh, this uh, uh, in this department. Um, after I graduated, uh, uh, at the same time the, the war with Iran was, uh, was over. <laughs> so, and also the other war, 1991, was over. Um, I was uh, uh, in, uh, in a member of the engineering consultancy team um, uh, who was assigned to uh, uh, participate in rebuilding Iraq. So um, uh, we did so many projects. Uh, we rebuilt them, the projects that were destroyed uh, during the war. And, um, and after that, in, uh, after few years, I opened my own contracting firm. And that was a big challenge for me, being a woman. And even when I registered my name in the Union of uh, uh, Iraqi Contractors, I got my, uh, my ID with a father name, not Fatin, which is a female, which is a male name, because they think that uh, it can't be a woman. So maybe so there's a mistake in, in the writing. So spelling mistake. So I got my ID with another name, a father name, not Fatin. So th that was um, uh, interesting. But um, uh, I, I got involved in construction field and in, uh, in all, uh, all uh, aspects. I was, uh, I was trained and uh, tried to get, uh, to gain experience through the projects I was involved in uh, with the government and also after that through my firm. Um, I had to leave Iraq in 1999 and that's a long story. I don't want to go through it now, but I moved to Jordan where I stayed for one year and then I managed to come to Dubai uh, and um, uh, I settled here uh, since 1999. Now it's more than 20 years. I've been living in Dubai. Um, uh, I was working with the, I started working with the, with some construction companies as project manager and, and project director and hub tour group. And then I was assigned to, to take the position of managing director for Sheikh Mohammed Bar Rashid engineer's office. Uh, I managed more than 600 uh, people in that department. Uh, and then <clears throat> we did so many projects in, in, in Dubai and, and other Emirates. Um, but in 2009, I had to open my, uh, I, I decided to open my own firm, uh, uh, specialized in interior design, architecture, and also interior fit out work. Um, I know that women in general, they face so many challenges in their lives. Uh, but the women in Iraq, I believe, she's facing more challenges. Uh, with all these uh, uh, tragedies and all these uh, circumstances that she went through because of what's done, what's happening in the country. Uh, so many wars and 13 years of sanction and, and the, what happened in 2003 and after that, and now the coronavirus, which I believe it's, it's, it's very small challenge compared to what she, what she faced before. Um, but I believe that Iraqi woman is a very strong uh, woman and she's a very strong person. She's passionate. Uh, she, has, uh, she has the ability to adapt and, and find solutions for any difficulty she's facing. I so believe in that and I can find it uh, on ground. I can find so many, uh, uh, I don't have now the time to, to go through them. But it always, we always find uh, alternative, we always find different way uh, to, to, to go through the difficulties. Um, for instance, uh, uh, during this coronavirus issue, I know one, one young woman who just opened her bookshop a couple of months before the, the pandemic. 
she immediately adapted and she changed the way of selling books. And she started doing this to WhatsApp. She gets orders from WhatsApp and Facebook page and delivering the books uh, to, to, the, to the people who ordered them. Um, I, I know so many who open their own YouTube channel uh, uh, in cooking, uh, giving interior design or decoration tips. Um, I know one very uh, well-known TV presenter. Uh, she lives out of Iraq, but she's Iraqi. She started giving lessons on tips on how to uh, uh, present news and being a reporter or, or, uh, or being a TV uh, uh, presenter. So all these, uh, all these things um, making us believe that no matter what, what we face as women, we always have, to, we have the ability to find alternatives. We have ability to find solutions. And I think that uh, uh, all what Iraqi women now, especially the, the, the young generation, all what they need now is support. Uh, it, it, it could be even a word can, can make a big change. Um, as what, what, what you are doing also on IBDC and what you mentioned somewhere in the beginning, the train can do is just give little support. And I think that's why I decided four or five years ago to write my biography. And I, I never thought that one day I'm, I'm going to be like some people now are calling me a writer. Uh, I never thought that I, I, will, I will write and publish my writing, but I think one of the, the uh, goals that I wanted to achieve is this, to, to give uh, uh, examples to, uh, to these young, uh, young women, to, to deliver a message that they can do, they are able to do anything they want, they have the right to follow their dream, and no matter what they face, no matter what the obstacles they do, I put this in a book, uh, in a sort of diaries. And I wrote all what I've been through, even when I was in the third year studying architecture in Baghdad University. And during the summer uh, holiday, I was in Basel with my family and my, my, uh, my house was bombed and I was injured in my uh, shoulder. So, and then after, after Couple of weeks, I was I was in the third stage in studying, con continuing my architecture study. Um, also, all the obstacles I faced when I graduated, when I came alone, when I left Iraq alone, all these I, I put them in a book. And I, and my aim is not to show off or just to to show how why why I, I became what I became, but to to give. Um, these women some sort of encouragement that no matter what you face, no matter what obstacles uh, that life will, will, will put in your path, you still can stand and you can still uh, can, can, uh, move on and fulfill your dreams. Um, you asked me somewhere about what I'm doing now and how this coronavirus affecting me. I, I will, I'll do it quickly so I, I don't take more time. Um, I'm a mother of twin daughters. They are 16 years old. And um, as, as a businesswoman, um, I don't spend much time with my family because I, I spend a lot of time in, in the site work and also in my office and in writing and reading. So this, uh, these few months, it was a good chance for me to, uh, to cook everyday meal for my kids, <laughs> my husband, and that was a big thing for them because I used to cook for them only during the weekend before, and now it's every day. So that's, that's a good change. And it's a, it's a nice question, what, what will we have for lunch, mom? That's a good question to get every day. <laughs> so this is a good thing. The bad thing is, um, uh, is that they were very af affected by, because they, they had to study online and because uh, they are in British uh, uh, schools and the British government decided to cancel the um, uh, A-level exam and the uh, GCSE exam. So uh, they were really 
stressful and that's affected them uh, in a bad way. But because I'm here and their dad also, we, we managed to, to go through this uh, in a smooth way. And now they are doing very well. Um, the good thing also about uh, being home is uh, that uh, I found uh, uh, a good time, extra time for me to, to move on with my third novel. Uh, and I hope I will finish it and will be able to publish it by the end of the year. I do also some translation work. And uh, from, from the office point of view, and because we have two, uh, uh, two departments in our, in our company, it's the design department and the project management and, and fit out. So the construction site was on hold. We just started yesterday only, uh, going back to our work in, in, in the field. But the design work never stopped. So we still, we, we, we managed to, to complete to do our drawings and to communicate this with, 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 with each other, the staff and I. And, um, and my, my, uh, I want to give a message also to all business uh, um, owners, not only business women, but also businessmen, that uh, we have to think, uh, to, to think of others, not only of ourselves. Um, I didn't cut the salaries of my, my uh, uh, employees. I didn't ask anyone to leave. I, uh, I also asked them if, if you have to, uh, if you want, if they, they open the airports and uh, you want to go home to see your families, I will pay for your tickets. Of course, this is a lot of financial uh, pressure on my side uh, with, with this uh, uh, situation, but I was employee one day, and I, I don't want I, I don't want my boss to come one day and give me my termination letter uh, that will affect my 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 life and my whole family, because everybody has bills to pay, they have family to look after, so we shouldn't be selfish and and only think of ourselves and our businesses. We have to think of others because without these people, we'll never succeed. So this is my my message to everyone who who own a business, and for the Iraqis, I. My, my message to them, especially women, is to think of <clears throat> private sector, invest more in themselves and their education and their training, and try to open their own business, no matter how small it is. <clears throat> it is way better than relying on government employment and, and all these uh, things that, that some people are, are supporting. I hope I didn't take much time. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Fatim. Very impressive, very impressive information and very, uh, very impressive uh, message that you deliver at the end. Thank you so much. I think we need to be kind as much as we could with each others in order, you know, to work together to avoid all the uh, troubles and constraints that we are all in all the world uh, struggle with. So uh, now I will uh, leave the uh, talk to. Uh, Samar Rassam, as we call her Samar too. So please, the speech is yours now, and uh, we would like to listen to your uh, ups and downs uh, that is, uh, you know, coming with the uh, current situation. So please, Samar, go ahead. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to speak, and uh, hello and hi to everybody. Uh, thank you, Samar, of course, Samar number one, as we call you. Um, I'm here, yes, as you have done the introduction, I'm here on different capacities and different hats. Um, I am, an, as an Iraqi, this is number one, and as Iraqi and businesswoman and running founding founder of uh, Somar Industrial Project since 2008. And uh, last year, since April last year, I was appointed uh, board director with the Chamber of Commerce, and I'll talk about this with regard to the COVID, what we are doing. And uh, also, I'm consulting two firms with automation, with control system engineering here in the UK, and we are working with Iraq. Uh, graduated from University of Technology in uh, control and system engineering from Baghdad. I say Baghdad, but others, they say Baghdad, so we pronounce it 
yeah, you know, we say about that. And upon graduation, I was really lucky. I joined Ministry of Oil and I work with state company for oil projects, Scope. And uh, as it was technical field, I needed the support from the family, you know, when you work with this and to work with male, our counterpart male, really I was having very good support from the family. And you touched that summer once, last time in Dubai, I think you touched that and you mentioned that, yeah. We always have the support from the family and that's very important. And uh, my father was telling me, well, if you are good in technical, either you are male or female, you can succeed and you can do what you can, you can achieve and you have no problem. So when I joined the ministry, I, uh, as an instrument engineer, the first year uh, we were trained. The ministry has a program and uh, we were trained and there was a location of funding at that time, which is very good. And we were rotating in different departments, different engineering department, uh, uh, piping in um, electrical process and all the other departments, plus the, uh, planning and cost, which is very important also. And my second year, we were going to visit sites that include pumping station, pipelines, Dora refinery, other refineries, and uh, that will add more experience to everyone. So then my first project when I started to work was Kirkuk, Kirkuk, which is 265 kilometers north of Iraq, north of Baghdad, sorry. And uh, the project gave me a very good opportunity to start and to be engaged and to do my role as instrument engineer. The second project which I moved on was uh, in Rashidiya, East Baghdad field, and it's 42 kilometers from east of Baghdad. And uh, I was really in this case with East Baghdad, which is always I mention it and I talk about it because it gives me very good opportunity. Because normally when we were doing design, um, they will send the engineers, the male engineers abroad and female, no, no, no. And then the minister that time he asked, he said, can you suggest any woman, anyone can, is there no men? I mean, the, the company and the Minister of Oil is a very good percentage of female engineers and technicians in the different departments. So then my name was put through and then my name was chosen three out of two. So three, two male and were out and myself and I start to travel and that opens a very good opportunity. So always I say like if women given the opportunity, they can do a lot. So then later after that, uh, I moved to work a few years and I, for whatever reason, we know Iraq, all Iraqis, each one has his own story. Every family has different and own stories. So I was here on business trip in 1990, June 1990 to finish my training. And I was returning back to Iraq on 2nd of August, 1990. That was the day of invasion of Kuwait. There was no flight to go back for, and I stayed here and my London become my base and I settled here. Then I, uh, the education in Iraq was very good. And really like we were trained well, the education was very good. So I didn't have any difficulty to find a job when I started my work here in UK. So I joined Bechtel and I worked with them as junior instrument engineer. And then uh, I uh, actually back there they were doing a job in Iraq. So they know of Iraqi, so they know of the Iraq, Iraqi caliber and Iraqi education. So I didn't have any problems. So I was again, one of the luckiest persons. After that, I joined AMEC and AMEC Fleur. We, uh, we won a job to, in 2003 to rebuild one of the, main contractors for involved in rebuild Iraq. And uh, so I was progressing from junior instrument engineer to lead instrument engineer until the Iraqi project came. I was involved with the Iraqi project 
and that was in 2003. We know the situation, what happens in 2003. And uh, my boss, he came, he said, Summer, leaders are not born. We are going to transform you to make you in the team as we want you to work for the Iraqi projects. And they gave me a, a good responsibility to manage the project and to be business development and marketing manager and building relation with Iraq and you know the capability of the local contractors who they are going to execute the work for the company. And in that, I, I know I must not talk about what like I like it because that's what happens uh, to interrupt you, Samar, yeah. um, my sincere apology to interrupt you because we are running in time. Yes. I would finish this is story because really it's a very good story. Good. Yeah. So would you mind, please, if you just concentrate on the challenge that you... I know. I will just like finish this allow me the story because really I'm very happy with it because like this, maybe I will make it very fast. So 2003, again, Iraq was open and then and the ex-minister of oil, Mr. Thamr al Jabban, was visiting with a team and uh, uh, of course that time all the media, all the media that came to meet him and one of the editor, one of the magazines, women in business magazines, they asked the team, the Iraqi delegation, if they can uh, suggest any name for any woman to speak in the coming conference, women international conference. And the Iraqi team, they say, here, here we go, she's, our, she's one of us, she used to work with us, and Iraqis at the moment are isolated. So that gave me a very good opportunity. What I want to mention this, because the opportunity was given to me in Iraq from my Iraqi team. And again, here in UK, the Iraqi helped me. So I'm really grateful to that. So back to the situation of the COVID, which we are now all struggling and the oil prices. And uh, yeah, uh, we are having, as the chamber, we are having a task force and we are helping the SMEs and uh, that's the task force which we have from a panel, which is lawyers, uh, HR, um, marketing people. So I hope the same will happen with Iraq because like this is what this SMEs, the small business is going to help the economy. And I hope the same thing will happen to Iraq, the private sector rebuild to nourish the private sectors and make them involved. This is one point which is, uh, which will help Iraq generally. And I'm not going to speak about the COVID and you know, you need to wash your hands, all this type of things. We know all this stuff, uh, we know. But the, uh, the technology, we touched like Caroline, yourself, Patin, all of us, we touched about the technology nowadays and there's nowhere far. And we are doing everything as today, like this Zoom. And, uh, and we are connecting with Iraqis at the moment more and more. And especially nowadays, we are working from home, so that saves us travel, we are not going, so the time is for us. We are doing the things we were not able to do, including, for example, I created WhatsApp for our street, and we start, all of us, become united and help each other. And I think this is very good things, like at least there's positive things coming from this crisis so not everything is negative and uh, I mean we're living in the street I live in since 1993 I know the street but the others they don't know each other so now they are all connecting when we help the elderly people the team the street is really so I think that's one thing which is yeah so Iraq need really the education I emphasize but you touched it all of you you know just like we talked about the education because I think for me education 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 is the best. You know, in UK we say if you want to buy a property, location, 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 I think education, 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 plus again the health sector need, you know, like uh, a lot of our scientists, uh, scientists, doctors from Iraq, they left Iraq and they settled somewhere else, so there's a shortage of the medical staff there and the training, they are not allocating any money to do. So I think we need even now training. I mean, your company you do health, safety, and environment, and you are doing a very good job. Now there will be a health, safety, and environment for the pandemic things. 
including how to follow and to do the measurement with this type of thing. So Iraq need to, like with your company and other companies, Iraq need to follow these rules. And also here, everywhere, like, yeah, so globally, everywhere, you know, that's so. So one of the things which I think also what Iraqis need, for example, if we have a factory which is not working in Iraq, the Ministry of Industry, and we have a factory which is not working, so probably either to rehabilitate the factory or the new product, they create a new production line. And then by this, they will hire people, the unemployment figure will, will be less. This is one thing which I think, uh, like, uh, I mean, but I don't want to repeat because you have touched most of the things about what we are doing with the digital things and uh, training, online training, uh, uh, which now it's easier to do it until things go to normal. I mean, we know the travel is affected. So hopefully in the near future, things will go back to normality and we can visit Iraq and we can, we can share the know-how and we, we can do the know-how and transfer the knowledge from now. I mean, we are doing it, but like now with the digitalization, we can do it more. And hope all stay safe and uh, any questions? I'm ready. Thank you so much, Samar. Thank you very much for your interesting speech. And it's very, very good that despite all this uh, uh, human tragedy that some people see positivity. This is very nice message out of, come out of your words. So now we uh, going to Paulina. I'm sorry, Paulina, sorry, because pa I think you misjudged by the time and because you've been the last speaker. No so worries. I would be grateful if you highlight your path within, you know, uh, five to, to 10 minutes talk uh, to talk about your sector, about the uh, way of uh, your colleagues in your sector thinking towards the situation and toward Iraq in general. So please. Thanks, Amar. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. It is a great pleasure to be part of the webinar and thanks to the IBBC for putting it together. Uh, my name is Paulina Argudin. I am a senior analyst for the Intelligence and Advisory Services at G4S Risk Consulting. We operate in the security sector. Uh, I've been working uh, for G4S Risk Consulting for over a year and I cover Iraq, which is one of our main countries of operation. And I also cover Afghanistan and support some of our high scale security projects. I know we're very um, short on time, so I'm gonna try to keep it um, quite tight. I think there's already been a, a great points covered by all the panelists and a lot of information to absorb. Uh, but I just wanted to share with you some of the challenges we've faced as a company in the industry that are also common to uh, many other industries that are uh, facing the current situation of COVID. And also want to share some uh, positives and the importance that, I, that it has been uh, for us to remain agile and flexible in order to protect our staff, clients, providers, and also um, to find ways to adapt uh, to the current situation. So uh, the security industry and G4S, um, as most other economic sectors have been negatively impacted by COVID. Uh, for G4S Risk Consulting, uh, which is part of G4S as a whole, but also operates uh, independently, uh, it has been quite a mixed bag. Uh, some areas um, there or teams have seen some arising opportunities from COVID but other business uh, areas, such as our Iraq business, have been negatively affected. Uh, restrictions of movement imposed by governments to prevent uh, the spread of the virus uh, have impacted um, some of our teams and also has, this has meant that we are unable to send people to Iraq or bring people back uh, to their countries. And this has, me this has meant for us that, uh, that it has put a lot of, uh, of jobs at risk. Um, for the company as a whole, COVID has presented enormous challenges. It also has disrupted the way we work, uh, as some of the, the panelists have already presented. And it also has showed us uh, the importance uh, as a business to remain agile in the way we respond to clients and also staff needs. And I highlight staff needs because, of course, we, we're a team and 
uh, if we want a successful business, we need to, to put attention to all parts of the business. So staff, um, suppliers, clients, and look at this in a, in a holistic way. So this ties a bit to, to Fatin's uh, point about resilience and the need to find ways to, you know, to adapt to the problems that have been presented to us, and in this case, uh, COVID. So uh, with the remote working becoming a bit more uh, prevalent or the norm in the current environment, um, the company has implemented the remote, uh, the remote working policies uh, that covers everything, trying to make it very clear. So from where a team is expected to work, uh, what are the different communication channels available? And that is very important to us because communication is key um, in, in the consulting industry and in every other industry. And also uh, presenting very clear uh, responsibilities of which, ta which tasks are gonna be completed by which team members and trying to make um, everything as clear as possible and accountability. Uh, so we will implement regular team and company meetings to enhance communication and also to create a forum where we can present the problems that are arising week by week discuss them and also be able to, to present solutions. Um, and in order to make things work, we usually collaborate closely, but obviously this is a challenge being uh, working from home and everyone's um, environment is, is different. So this has led for all of us to understand, or especially for management to understand everyone's living conditions within the team, in the company, and the challenges we faced at a, at a personal level. So we all have a personal, uh, unique situation. Some of us have stronger social networks than others. Some of us have more responsibilities at home than others. Some of us have a better uh, work-life balance than others. Some of us have better um, strategies to cope than others. And as such, it's important to understand those nuances. And as Amar and Fatan also mentioned, like to be, to be kind and understanding. So uh, one of the big challenges in our, um, in our team was how we can achieve a fulfilling work-life balance and also to protect our mental health. And this, is, this was particularly challenging at the beginning um, of the lockdown, uh, but it remains um, a, constant, a constant challenge. So we are currently experiencing an environment of high uncertainty, high stress at work, uh, personal lives, just in general in the future. And some of us face potential uh, greater responsibilities at home. And we have very little time uh, to decompress, to spend time of, uh, on our own, to get just a minute to, to relax and, and rest. And the shift of, uh, from working in an office to working from home has put a significant strain on all of us, but particularly for us women, because we tend to, to hold greater responsibilities, uh, both care and domestic responsibilities than men. Uh, I personally don't, don't have kids, um, but I know that for parents and all single parents, uh, many of whom them are women, are likely to be in a particularly challenging position, um, having to combine work and, and personal life and kids' um, education all at once um, in, a, in a very limited uh, space and also of uh, 24 hours in the day. So as such, we need to make sure that uh, while we continue to hit our, our targets and we want to make the business successful, we can only do that if we um, make sure that our, all of our employees are, are taken care of. Um, we also learned uh, the need to focus on long-term decisions um, in order to protect not only our employees, but also everyone in, as part of a sort of everyone that is part of our supply chain. So our clients as subcontractors, um, because without all of them, there will be no business for us. So I just wanted to share with you one of, um, an example that illustrates this quite well. And it is that our finance team is working really, really hard to make sure that all of our suppliers and contractors are, um, are paid. And I mentioned this because G4S um, being in the in the security sector, we rely we have a full time team in place, but we rely a lot on on the work that has been done by our by our contractors. So if we don't pay our contractors, um, we we won't be able to operate. And for us, this was a, a decision first 
that was implemented by by group or by G4S, and that our finance team pushed and management put a, uh, pushed a lot on, and they have managed to continue to pay them because we understand that we are just the link in the chain. So um, if we don't pay our suppliers, then they won't be able to pay our employees. So then there's going to be people that won't be having that uh, regular income that they used to have. And we, we put those businesses and sometimes small businesses in a very um, difficult financial position. So I think that's been quite a, a, a big win uh, for us and always think that, yeah, we are facing very um, short-term and long-term challenges with COVID and we will have to reassess that posture as, as, as we go forward. But for now, we need to like um, make an effort to, to protect everyone that we work on, not only directly, but also also indirectly, because key is, uh, trust is key in, you know, for every industry and particularly for us that work in, um, in security. And um, also another thing I wanted to, to highlight, um, the security industry is very male uh, dominated, also a lot of uh, military background. So obviously as a woman, sometimes it is quite challenging to try to, you know, prove yourself in, in the industry, maybe with a different background, like in my case, I'm an economist. So sometimes like, we want to, you know, work a bit uh, harder and prove ourselves. And, and this can be challenging, particularly with remote working when you're, you know, you want to, if people see that you're working, and, but you also have other things on. And I think that one of the positives that I can highlight is that um, the management team, but also my team has been very, very good with that. And uh, in my team, we are a majority women. So, so that also uh, uh, helps a lot. We've been quite uh, supportive with, with each other, encourage uh, each other a lot. And I think that I can say that empathy can go a long way. Uh, so we need to, to be more um, aware of people's uh, situations and, and, and particular or personal um, environments or conditions. And just try to protect each other and protect those who are more, most vulnerable. So those are the, um, the couple of, of points I wanted to highlight and share with you today. Uh, thank you very much for your time. So I'll pass it over to you, Samar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paulina. Thank you very much for making the speech in a limited time. And it's very interesting and very inspirational that you know we see the women leading uh, uh, security uh, sector. It's very, very nice and very inspirational, to be honest. You know, especially to work with uh, a male that come from a uh, military background. It's very interesting. So wish you all the best. Thank you very much. And really, I want to thank all of you for what has been addressed and uh, for the informative uh, information that uh, and conversation that you have uh, provided. Uh, at the end uh, of this webinar, I would like to say that while this crisis has generated a lot of uh, crunch and challenges all over the world, it also has created a big opportunities, partic particularly in the technology uh, sectors. Uh, we have to think about this uh, stories about this tragedy in a positive way. We have to stay positive. We have to stay uh, looking forward for our bright future because now the companies uh, have moved to remote working and the school have uh, moved to homeschooling and business need to be um, innovative in order to keep the continuity of the uh, work and business. So we have to stay uh, focused. We have to stay uh, uh, aligned in, in the way. And I think this uh, epidemic, I think it's give us an opportunity to look to our deep down. This is one of the uh, important factors that we have to think about it. Because all previous time we've been busy in our social work, in our business work, but we were away from ourselves, from our uh, 
deep down. So it is an opportunity to think about ourselves, to think about our families, to stay close to them. And it is an opportunity as well to stay close to our beloved ones and to support them to increase their positivity and to help our people that we are uh, working with in our uh, work sectors. Because sometimes one uh, assistance from one person, either it will be a financial uh, assistance or it will be a sympathetic ear or a humble advice, it will help a lot and it will help many people. So we have to stay positive and we have to live with this scenario uh, in a way that we protect ourselves. Yesterday, actually, I have uh, listened to one Chinese uh, economist. He said one uh, statement that I liked it a lot. He said, Corona is like your wife. Initially, you try to control it then you realize that you can't. Then you learn to live with it eventually. So we have to, to live with this uh, situation in, in a positive way. So I hope that you uh, make use of this uh, one hour and a half and uh, you get interested and you got, you got good information out of our uh, speakers. So uh, I hope that you have a few questions that could be answered by our panelists. And I leave that to Agni to handle. So thank you so much for all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Samar, for being such a wonderful uh, host of the, of the meeting. Uh, we can take uh, one, one or two questions from the audience. Uh, please raise your hand icon if you have any questions. I think I think the audience uh, doesn't have any questions, so we, have, we can uh, finalize it. Um, thank you each of the panelists for, for sharing all your knowledge and insights. And I would like to thank all the attendees as well for, for joining us today. And uh, please uh, follow our social media for further webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you very, everyone and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.